My argument is that, you know, a political ecology can help us to, uh, to explain the crisis in the Sahel. But before I start to talk about um, uh, the crisis in the Sahel and in Mali in, in particular, um, I would just like to mention a, a couple of footnotes. First of all, if you are not familiar with political ecology, so this field called political ecology uh, can be broadly defined as the study of power relations in land and environmental governance. Uh, and ecology here uh, doesn't refer to the discipline of ecology, but to the environment more broadly as in, in uh, cultural ecology. I get two more, I have to <laughs> admit, to, uh, from the waiting room. So uh, political ecology emerged um, in the 1980s um, as a marriage between uh, uh, political economy and, and then cultural ecology. So some, some people complain that there is no ecology in, in political ecology, but actually there doesn't have to be an ecology in political ecology be because it doesn't relate to the discipline of ecology. Although uh, despite that, there is ecology in some political ecology. And the other note is that this is um, this what I'm going to present to you is a result of a long term cooperation I have had with uh, my Malian colleague, Buba Karba. Uh, we've known each other since 1997. And we've worked uh, closely together in various studies uh, since 2006, I think it is. Um, so when I have visited Mali the last few years, I've also stayed with his family. And he's a trained uh, lawyer and has worked many years for the United Nations. So he's not um, employed in any university or research organization, but he has a keen interest in research. And he's also um, about 20 years ago or more, he started an NGO called EVE, which means awakening. Uh, way, and um, in that NGO, he, he and his, um, organization has trained about 400 what they call um, paralegals. So these are uh, villagers who uh, has been trained then in um, issues of uh, democracy, human rights, state, state governance, um, decentralization, state law, policy, and so on. And so these people are then resource persons in their local communities. And the idea is that they in, by being trained in that way, they will be um, more able to negotiate with the state and perhaps resist state governance when, uh, when that is necessary. And um, now th these 400 people are in villages that um, are mostly controlled by various so-called jihadist groups. So these people, uh, you know, through cell phones, they represent a an incredible source of information for, for Bubakar. So he's, um, I would say, one of the best informed people in, in Bamako about what's happening in central Mali without being in central Mali. So uh, I'm lucky enough to draw on that network in, in my research. All right, so um, a bit about the background to the crisis in Mali. Uh, so since 2012, um, Mali has been in a deep insecurity crisis, which obviously also has large implication, large economic implications. Um, and so the crisis has three main um, causes, in my opinion. First is the, the civil war in Algeria in the 1990s. So the, the Islamists in, in um, Algeria were about to, to win the elections in 1990, uh, which made the... Um, the uh, just have to admit one more, which made um, the military government um, yeah, which made the military government stop the elections, which led into a um, civil war in in Algeria that lasted almost a decade, and um, and which radicalized the Islamists. So those who were not killed or accepted an amnesty, they um, they moved into northern Mali and um, became then more radicali uh, radicalized uh, jihadists. And many of them 
uh, established themselves in the in the Timbuktu area and um, and then established groups uh, that um, after a while uh, were linked up to Al Qaeda, and they also um, made quite a lot of money through uh, controlling smuggling of cigarettes and cocaine, and also taking Westerners as hostages. So they earned millions of euros that way. The second course is the NATO bombing of Libya in 2011, uh, October, I think, 2011, and the killing of, of Gaddafi. Gaddafi had thousands of Tureg soldiers in his army, and when Gaddafi was killed, um, these uh, Tuaregs uh, went back to Mali and, and Niger, heavily armed, which then um, boosted a um, Tuareg rebellion that was already simmering. And the third cause of the crisis is um, widespread um, bad governance and corruption in Mali, which I'll talk more about. So in 2012, the, the jihadist groups and, and the Tuareg rebels took, co they cooperated and they took control over Northern Mali. Um, but after a while, the, the jihadists were able to either recruit the Tuaregs into their organization or marginalized the secular uh, Tuaregs who were not interested in, uh, in being part of a jihadist organization. So, so this, this became a jihadist, um, you know, jihadist controlled area. And in, in um, January 2013, the jihadists started to move south to occupy more land. And that's when um, the French, no, sorry, the, the Malian president called um, France for help. And French troops came from, um, from Chad, where they are stationed flew to Bamako and then moved north and stopped this uh, jihadist in, uh, invasion around Mopti that you see on the map here. Um, but after, so this was in January 2013, but since then, um, the Malian army, the French army, there, there are still um, a few thousand French troops in, in Mali and also um, UN troops and, and other African troops. But they still only control the urban areas and to some extent the roads. But the rural areas north of, you can you see Segu on the map, north of Segu is uh, controlled by uh, various jihadist uh, groups, either um, saying that they um, you know, are, are allied with Al Qaeda or with uh, ISIL. Uh, so these groups also compete or um, struggle between themselves. So uh, this, um, this crisis in, in Mali and in the Sahel since uh, 2012 has um, led to a lot of international interest. Uh, so, so Mali and the Sahel have become sexy. Um, so there is a, now a lot of international uh, actors um, based in Bamako with uh, quite a lot of funding. So there, is, there are more, act more actors, more funding than good ideas. And, um, and this is, we see the same in, um, in research, that there has been a boom in, in published uh, research on the crisis in Mali. And, uh, and most of this research ha has focused on these uh, topics here, like the links between international jihadism and, um, and what's happening in Mali. Uh, drug trafficking and uh, the hostage taking as source of funding, the politics and history of Tuareg rebellions, the crisis in the national democratic system and the weakening of the state, the international military intervention and possibilities for peace, Islam in Mali, and the Malian crisis as a fallout from the Libya crisis. So a lot of this research is very good and interesting and um, in many ways, you know, useful. But our argument is that, um, uh, most of this research misses a, a, a crucial or in, an important point, and that is that the, um, the, these organizations, the rebel groups or insurgency groups or jihadist groups or whatever you want to call them, they increase uh, and become popular, not because they are linked to international jihadist groups or because of uh, some Islamist uh, religious awakening, but because of political ecology.
because of the politics of land and environmental governance. And this is missed by most of the research uh, carried out. That's what we try to uh, rectify through this um, the re the research that we are carrying out. So, um, yeah, so these groups are increasing in size um, and uh, they are probably increasing as we speak. Uh, they are, you know, they have, they are, there are more, more members, more fighters in these groups that there, there have ever been. Uh, they are more, more powerful now than, than they have ever been and so on. Despite the um, international uh, military intervention in, in Mali. So uh, what we have done is to study the speeches. One of the things that we have done is to study the speeches of this guy, Amadou Koufa. He is considered the paramount uh, jihadist leader in central Mali. So um, he's a Fulani, like Boubacar, who is also a Fulani. So his speeches are in Fulfulde, which is the language spoken by the Fulani. So Boubacar has translated this into French and then for me to be able to access them as well. So um, he has been called a jihadist entrepreneur, who is somebody who translates a global jihadist discourse to a local context. And he was, uh, it seems he was radicalized by uh, Pakistani missionaries, Pakistani Salafi missionaries in the early 2000s, and then later invited to Pakistan and other countries. And he now controls uh, several hundred, it's difficult to know, but we know that at least several hundred uh, fighters. And it's interesting that he speaks very little about uh, religion, actually. He speaks about corruption among the judges, government officials, and in particular, the Forest Service, which is this paramilitary um, forest police with, uh, you know, they wear uniforms and they are armed. Um, and he, um, he uh, talks about the, uh, the elites in the state and uh, the tr also the traditional elite. He calls for a more egalitarian and just society. He defends pastoralism and he, he uh, talks about um, the UN troops and the French troops as a form of new colonization of Mali. So, um, and this has uh, quite uh, some resonance among, uh, among peasants and in particular among pastoralists. In, um, in, and in particular in central Mali, since he speaks in Fulfulda, and then obviously in particular among the Fulani. Um, yeah, so I thought I should um, just give three brief examples of how uh, the politics of land uh, play a role in, uh, in strengthening these uh, jihadist groups or in, in uh, recruiting um, people to these organizations. So it's perhaps a bit um, overambitious to think that I can present three example, examples in such a short presentations, but also I have to simplify quite a lot. But I also probably need to say a little bit about this satellite image. It's, a, it's an image of the inland delta of the Niger River. Um, and so the Niger River runs towards the north from the south. So this is the river. And here is uh, the Bani River, a tributary to the, uh, to the Niger. So this is a large uh, floodplain that it's about 30,000 square kilometers. Mopti is um, up here. Um, and um, so th this huge area is also a, a huge resource. You know, there are fisheries here, there are a, a lot of rice is grown in the area. And it's also, an area with uh, an important fodder plant called the Burgu Echinocloa stagnina in, in Latin. So it's a plant that grows in, um, in water and which is an important uh, fodder reserve for the livestock um, in the dry season. So um, there is an organized system for managing and and organizing the entry of livestock to the Delta. And, and it's a system that was established in the Dina Caliphate that was um, established in 1818. 
um, so it's a pre-colonial uh, uh, caliphate uh, that formalized the, the rules of access and, um, and management of the delta. So um, the, the pastoralists, all pastoralists would know uh, because there are different entry points. They know where to enter at what date and they also know their ranking order. And at the entry points, there would be these uh, traditional chiefs called Joro. So there are 37 units in the Delta. So the, the Dina organized the Delta into 37 units called Leide. And one Joro, one traditional chief, manages one Leide. So at the entry in November, the, um, the, the Joros would stand at the entry point and collect a fee. And traditionally, these fees has, have been symbolic. But during the last few decades, they have, they have increased quite a lot to become substantial amounts of money. And, um, and not only Joros collected these fees, but uh, they, you know, the, 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 the increase in fees are basically the result of politicians and government officials joining this event and collecting um, a large part of the fees. So these, this became very unpopular among uh, pastoralists. And by the way, now that uh, the jihadists um, control this area, they have told the Joros, you continue as before, but no fees. You don't collect any fees. So that's, that's one reason why the jihadists have become popular among pastoralists. But now I'm anticipating a bit my, my uh, second example here. But anyway, so that's sort of the geographical context. Um, yeah, so then to desertification. So um, in uh, 1982, um, Mali uh, got an agreement with the, um, the World Bank, a structural adjustment agreement with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund which meant of course that they had to, to reduce their, um, their administrative staff, state, uh, state number of state officials. And, um, and at the, but, at the, but in the same decade, you got the, um, the big Sahelian drought, a lot of international at attention to desertification, a lot of money coming into fight desertification. You got the, the Brundtland report in 1987, with a lot of attention to sustainable development. And these together led to a lot of funding coming to the forest service, this militarized uh, you know, armed service that was then mandated to stop desertification. And so, so while the state administration decreased, the forest service increased and in numbers and you know, funding and so on manifold during the late eighties, early nineties. And the forest, there would be forest offices in all districts, and um, and they um, well, when I did field work in um, in northern Mali in the late eighties and early nineties, and I came to a village with you know mud houses of houses of clay, and there was would be one house with in cement with a satellite dish and uh, an off road motorbike outside. I would know that that's where the forester lives. So the foresters um, have, you know, been able to give people fines for collecting dry wood or having goats that are believed to create deserts. Uh, and, and over time, they beca became immensely unpopular. So in, in periods when um, there have been a vacuum in government in this area, people have attacked the foresters and even killed foresters. Um, yeah, so that's um, one reason why, you know, how um, political ecology then um, can be used to explain why people have turned against state administration and joined jihadist groups. Another is linked to what I talked about um, a couple of minutes ago about the, um, the pastoral access to the Delta and how um, development policies have tended to support agriculture. And so rice cultivation has also encroached on these Burgo pastures. In addition, you've had, um, you've had uh, livestock corridors being blocked by, by farming. Uh, and, but of course, when the troops, the livestock herds uh, go towards the Delta in, in November to enter the Delta, they, 
they need to, there are established livestock corridors and, and they need to pass. So when large herds pass areas that have been, uh, you know, cultivated, then you get crop damage and you get farmer herd conflicts. So Bubakar and I, um, around 2006, seven, we did field work for a, um, an article that was published in 2009 on farmer herd conflicts in this area. And we found that some of these conflicts also went to the courts. Um, and we saw that the, both parties would bribe both um, traditional leaders and government officials. And then when, when the cases went to the courts, they would also bribe the, uh, the judges. And you got these ridiculous uh, judgments where, which tried to please both parties. So, um, so the, the conflicts just continued. And the last example, I just have to admit one more. So the last example, um, there are more people joining here. Okay, um, yeah, so the last example is um, Fulani and Dogon conflicts, uh, which are more recent. Um, so you have the, the, the um, Niger Delta here, and well, these conflicts became um, mediatized, especially after the attack at, uh, you see the Ogosago village there on this map. Um, there was an attack there by this militia that you see on the picture, picture the Dana Amasago uh, militia, which is a Dogon militia. They attacked the, um, Ogosago village, uh, the, the Fulani part of this village in, on the 23rd of March, 2019 and killed 175 people, half of them children. So that, um, this was, you know, um, uh, resulted in headlines internationally. Um, I was actually also interviewed on uh, Al Jazeera after that attack. And so there, there was a lot of attention and you, you and and explanations were often that you know this these conflicts were caused by climate change and population growth. And I think it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, so let me try to explain this quickly. Um, so the, the Fulani are uh, one of the biggest ethnic groups in West Africa and uh, the second biggest in, in Mali. Um, and they are the traditional, I mean, the last few hundred years, they have been the rulers in central Mali. They've had, you know, they, they had the Dina Caliphate, for instance, which, which was based, which was a Fulani Caliphate, basically, uh, that I mentioned, for, for example. So there have been Fulani rule in this area, and the Dorgon have been sort of under Fulani rule, and they have also had to seek refuge from the Fulani uh, on the Dogon Plateau. So we have, so this is an, an elevated area and there are, there is an escarpment here uh, where some, with some very picturesque uh, villages in the escarpment uh, and looking out over the, the savannah. And this escarpment has worked as a sort of a fortress for the Dogon um, to protect themselves against, against the Fulani. But, um, and so the, the confinement of the Dogon on the, the escarpment and on the plateau has led to a land scarce, scarcity on, on the plateau. So you, you might say that this area has become over, became overpopulated in the pre-colonial time. But um, with you know, French colonization, uh, Mali became a, um, a French Sudan, French colony in 1895. And then you got what uh, is called uh, the colonial peace. So the French established some sort of peace between the groups in the area, which led, made the Dogon uh, able to move down to the plains below and start to farm and establish villages. And over time, this has created conflicts between the, the, the fields, uh, the, the farming of the Dogon and the, um, the, the pastoral Fulani in the area. So the Fulani are, I mean, Fulani are both farmers and, and pastoralists, but many Fulani are pastoralists 
while Dogon are farmers. So that's one uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, traditional farmer herd conflict. But, um, but in addition, many Fulani, as I've said, have joined jihadist organizations. Uh, so, um, and the Malian army has not been very successful, as I've also mentioned, to fight the jihadist groups. So they have, when they have confronted these groups, they have uh, very often lost. And so in 2018, the Malian army and the Malian state started to sponsor and train these militias instead. And since 2018, they have attacked and burned down uh, more than 100 villages, Fulani villages in the area and killed more than 2,000 people. And which has led to thousands of, of Fulani um, fleeing to Burkina Faso. So this area is now devastated by, by this conflict between the Dogon and the Fulani. So yeah, so to make, I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying of course, but, um, but that's sort of the main, our main argument. So it, it is a farmer herd conflict, but it can also be seen as in terms of a conflict between an insurgency and a counterinsurgency that is sponsored by the state through this militia. Listen, somebody hasn't muted, so there is a sound somewhere. Okay, um, yeah, so I, I mentioned that um, if you look at the, the international media, these conflicts are often explained as, um, you know, uh, climate change induced conflict uh, in addition to a conflict caused by um, population growth. So I, I've just included two cuts here, one from the reputable Le Monde saying that climate change and demographic pressure are at the roots of the, the violence in the Sahel. And this is Deutsche Welle saying that the conflict between the Dogon and Fulani ethnic groups over resources in Mali has been exacerbated by climate change, population growth, and absentee state and Islamism. Actually, the state has not been so absent here. It has actually, uh, you know, caused the whole conflict basically. So um, it's also interesting to note that Norway has become now member of the security, the UN's Security Council since January. And um, in, on the 23rd of February, Anna Solberg gave a speech to the Security Council where she um, said something about what Norway will focus on in, in the, these two years. And one of four focus areas for Norway in, in its work in, in the Security Council is what is called climate security. So that's the link between climate change and conflicts. And um, Anna Solberg also mentioned then the Sahel as an example where climate change is fueling conflicts. And I think that's potentially dangerous because it will, it will, um, it risk to, to gloss over the, the real causes of these conflicts. Climate change is of course affecting the Sahel, but um, when, if you make a list of causes of, um, of the conflicts and the violence in the Sahel, the climate change come very far down that list. It potentially it can of course contribute in the future, but at the moment it's very far down that list, but it tends to get a lot of international attention. So uh, yeah, so just to sum up, I, I'm not sure how much time I've used, but just to sum up, um, this jihadist narrative in Central Mali is attractive to subordinate classes. So the, these are people who, you know, the, like the Rimaibe and the Bella. Rimaibe are the, the former slaves of the Fulani and the Bella are the former slaves of the Tuareg. These are very hierarchic societies and the, well, they are not slaves as such, but um, they have been doing most of the manual work. And they see these jihadist groups as an um, opportunity to li liberate themselves from their subordinate social position. And then it's attractive to many Fulani, as I've said, and many pastoralists. And here are some of the 
well, not some of that. <laughs> These are the publications that Bubakar and I have published together. So one article here on farmer herd conflicts from 2009, and one on why pastoralists in Mali joined jihadist groups, um, and then one which is now in review with the journal um, on the Fulani Dorgon killings in Mali. Thank you.